husband and I run by Lumiere and today we are in North Bucks and we're here because we're filming an online how-to for WEX and it's how to photograph food professionally. So I've been a professional photographer now for gosh about 13 years and I actually started as what I would call a, a people photographer but as time went on, I began to develop into personal branding photography and all kinds where food comes into it. So chefs and nutritionists. And as soon as you have to photograph something new, it often brings you new challenges. So I began to look into it and actually really, really loved it. And over the years, it's actually led to me doing a TV masterclass. And so that experience is really what I'm here to share with you. So as part of this how-to, we're actually gonna be showing you two very different setups, one for food and one for drink. And as part of that, I will be discussing styling and lighting and um, tips and techniques. But let's start with the camera kit and what I use and why. Okay, so let's start with the camera. When I started in photography, I was actually shooting on DSLRs and Nikon. And then about four years ago now, I did a major switch to, to mirrorless and to Sony. And now we very much shoot Sony bodies and Sony lenses only. And we actually have a number of Sony bodies depending on what we're doing, the kind of work we're doing. And to be honest, you, food photography is really very flexible in terms of kit. So you can shoot with almost anything you can shoot with kit lenses so I don't want you to be afraid by this I'm just going to talk you through the kind of lenses that I use I'm going to explain to you why I use them but fundamentally uh, don't be scared so my camera of choice today is actually the Sony 7R4 and whilst I could have used any of my Sony bodies I've chosen this specifically for the resolution so the 61 megapixels in here which is massive the reality of food photography and particularly drink photography is that you need quite a lot of detail if it's printed and you'll really see why when we get onto the drinks photography later so that is why all of my bodies give me the same benefits so I use my uh, LCD screen a lot more than actually my electronic viewfinder now and I it's absolutely see what you get in terms of white balance focus composition exposure absolutely love it for all of those reasons and they're small and they're easy to handle so that's why I've chosen this camera body and let's have a quick chat about lenses Obviously there are a lot of lens choices out there if you're using a camera with interchangeable lenses. So I'm going to start with what I believe to be the probably the most versatile and you're going to love to know it's the most affordable. And this is the 50 1.8. So it's still a super wide aperture lens, really small, really light, as I said, really affordable. A 50 mm focal length fundamentally means it's the closest to the human eye. So you're gonna find it very familiar when you're shooting. And with food photography, there are different, what we call angle of views that are absolutely critical. And this is gonna be able to do everything quite easily. Everything from kind of a, bird, a bird's eye, tabletop down view through to something more relevant to say burgers or things with height. So brilliant lens, can't really recommend it enough. Now, the other thing that's here is the same focal length. So you've heard me just talk about 50. This is also a 50, but it's a 2.8, so less able to deal, if you like, with low light. But the benefit of this is it's a macro lens. So what does that mean? It means I can get a lot closer. There's a much shorter, minimal focal distance, so I can get the lens much closer to the food and get some really incredible detail. Also, a very affordable lens. Moving on, we're getting more to the professional end of lenses here. And again, I use them because I have them. I'm not advocating that you need them for food photography. But also on the table, we've got an 85, so it's another prime lens. So what we call a fixed focal length lens. And that means I have to be a little bit further back, but it's really beautiful for drinks photography, actually. And then the other two here, we've got yet another prime lens. So a fixed focal length, which is the 135. Beautiful, beautiful lens, actually more relevant to people photography potentially, but can give a really gorgeous uh, food shot from a distance, really quite close in. And then there's just what we call the workhorse lens. We use the 2470 f2.8 Sony all the time for every type of photography that we do, photography and filming in fact. So again, it's not the cheapest lens, but it really is for us an absolute essential. 
We are obviously going to be looking at lighting and styling and I think it'll be more effective to do that while I'm working but it is important to remember that food photography tends to happen indoors and in the UK all year round we have to think about the quality of the image so our ISO levels and we have to think about obviously shutter and uh, aperture so stability matters I tend to be totally freehand running around with people photography not with food so I'm going to show you how I make sure the camera stays stable most food photographers will get themselves a tripod and honestly it's really necessary but again doesn't need to be over complicated what is really useful and make sure you have a look at this is that some tripods actually give you the ability to not obviously just be as you're used to them but to come up and out to enable you to do some overhead kind of downward shots which is super popular for food particularly on likes of Instagram and everything and this is definitely the setup that I started with in food photography but then I realized that I actually wanted to take the tripod legs out the way and so I spoke to my husband and I said hey can you help me try and create some kind of overhead rig and he just said I'm sure I can and um, he went to look at what we had because we obviously have lighting stands and all kinds and he literally fashioned this from what we have. So again, what I'm saying to you is think outside the box a wee bit. All you fundamentally need is the ability to, I would say, alter the height, that does matter, and then a, some kind of clamp to get the, the, the camera above at this angle. So this is very much for straight down shots, but we find it brilliant, it's totally stable. I would say that you can still obviously use the, the shutter to take the image from here, but you might also want to consider a remote or we actually use um, software, which I'll show you later. Because we're gonna be using some lighting today, and in fact, food photography and drinks photography is, all photography is dependent on light, let's be honest. I find sometimes it's quite hard to teach lighting when you're doing it with actual lights because people can panic a bit and maybe not look at what they should really be looking at. So I'm going to show you a really simple technique and I'm gonna use an egg and I really hope that this is gonna make a big difference for people who maybe struggle a little bit with seeing light because fundamentally that's what this is about. And the biggest thing I learned, the biggest lesson I learned years ago now is rather than trying to see light, you need to be looking at shadow because shadow is going to tell you everything you need to know. So let's get started. It's really important, I think, to not necessarily talk about good light and bad light, but rather to talk, talk about the quality of light. So soft light and hard light, because believe me, in both drinks and food photography, both have their place and both can be super effective. And it can slightly come down to personal taste, so let's have a look at actually what I'm referring to. I'm just using uh, a speed light here, but only because of it's actually got a modeling light on it. So it's really useful and I can quickly show you how to modify it and, and soften it. So fundamentally, hard light is about the fact that the, the rays of light hit the object, the subject, from a very similar angle. On a sunny day with no clouds, it is hard light because all of the angles hit. And what it does, what you need to do in order to determine whether it is hard light is look at the edge of the shadow. If the edge of the shadow is super clean and super sharp, you can be pretty assured that it's hard light. And I'm going to demonstrate this by now just popping a diffuser on, not changing anything, and you will actually see here particularly that the edges of the shadow have become an awful lot softer. As you know, I popped a modifier onto the speed light here, or let's call it continuous light, it's a modeling light. And this is basically just replicating what, shadow, what clouds do, sorry. And as soon as you put any kind of, of translucent material in front of a hard light source, it just scatters the light. So rather than everything hitting the subject at exactly the same angle, all of the light rays are scattered and it just produces a much softer spread of light. So this is what we call soft light or low contrast lighting, whereas a, a direct straight angled hard light source is gonna give you hard or high contrast light. As I said, both have their place. Most photographers would probably think that using soft light is the right thing to do with food or drinks photography, but actually it depends on what you're doing. Ideally, yes, you would probably want the shadows to be a little bit softer on the edge as we've shown you. And that can still be in quite a moody scenario, 
So definitely that's the more common use, but imagine if you wanted to actually shine a light that is looking like a blast of sunshine, a, a ray of actual sunlight, you're basically replicating nature, then you definitely need a hard light source and you might be really looking to do something quite creative with strong shadows. Most professional food photographers will use modifiers of some kind and we've mentioned diffusion, obviously with, with creating a, a softer, low contrast light source, but you'll also see people using reflectors a lot and reflectors can be all kinds of different colours, white is just the most straightforward, but also people using black V-flats or black card, and you may wonder why. Coming back to the egg, you can see obviously lighting it with a, a hard light source here, and we've got very deep shadows on the far side of the egg. When you bring in some form of ref reflective material, closer you come, you'll immediately see it's lifting those shadows, lifting those shadows, lifting those shadows, and it completely changes the very dark shadow side of the egg. So that is why people will use something in terms of a reflector. I'll show you a little trick with that later. Now a black card, you won't be able to see this quite as, as well because there's a lot of ambient light in the room, but black cards are actually used to deepen shadows So it, because it absorbs that reflected light and can actually make darker blacks look even more contrasty and that can be quite cool. So it's just to let you know why people are doing it. Last really important thing in terms of lighting and food is that it is different to people photography. And, and often every discipline or speciality of, of photography requires obviously different ways of working with light. So it's something I had to adjust to. So just to be clear, in terms of people photography, the safest, easiest light that most people use right from the beginning is what we call frontal light or flat light. So you can see the egg's now got a face. So we're imagining this is a human face. And it's this light that we, that we tend to look for with portrait photography right at the beginning. Super safe, a bit boring, but always makes skin and eyes look great. And what we don't want to do with, with uh, portrait photography, maybe with men but certainly not with women, is do anything that's too side lit because it fills all those wrinkles and lines and everything with shadow and can make people look really old. What we do often want to do though with people photography is do some backlighting but as you can see puts the face massively into shade so you really should be using some kind of fill flash reflector that kind of thing. So why is food different and particularly drink? With that we don't want to be lighting from the front. It's flat, it's boring, it doesn't show any form, it really doesn't work at all. And in fact, with drinks photography, it's a complete nightmare because of reflections, but I'm going to go into that later. So probably the most important way to light food is somewhere between direct backlighting through to actually side lighting or here and invariably you'll see that people are then using reflectors which is why I mentioned the white card earlier because opposite where your light source is even if that's natural light you'll find people are often bringing in some form of reflection to lift the shadows a bit so it really is a different way of thinking but you're going to see it all in action now. For the food photography setup we wanted to keep it as simple as possible and use natural light and we also decided to go with a cheese board because no cooking and all of you can go out and get the ingredients relatively easily. And on that note, if you look in the description below, you'll find what we used in case you want to recreate something super similar. Before we get into the, the, you know, the, the actual lighting and everything, which is very simple, as I said, it's natural daylight, I just want to talk a little bit about styling because if you get into food photography on a, a quite a high professional level, you will only be the photographer on the shoot and actually there could well be a prop stylist whose only job is to bring in the accessories and there could be a food stylist who's just there to make the food look amazing. And there are actually less inside tips and tricks than they used to be because really you wouldn't be able to touch the food on the plate afterwards and it's, I think it's, it's, it's more about a natural approach but there's still things that people do and I just wanted to talk about what I view to be some real essentials. So first off let's talk about backdrops because I do have a wooden surface here it's perfectly nice but it's not necessarily what I want. Styling is very personal and if you want to run food blogs or have an Instagram account about this then you can do whatever you want. It could be really interesting and you can, you know, it's, it's great. However, if you're going to do this commercially, you will have to be much more 
adaptable to what they want. Some of our food clients have wanted a very minimalist, simple approach and others really encourage styling. So again, that's going to be a case by case scenario. But these are called photo boards and it's a UK company. And I have to say they're absolutely brilliant. They're wipe clean. They do these uh, 60 by 60 boards and you can get smaller ones. And indeed, I think probably bigger ones. I've got quite a few now and they just give you a real adaptability and they're fantastic for flat lay. So this is the, the, the direct downward kind of look because think about it in terms of angle of view, the minute we start to come into a lower angle of view, then the background comes in. So sometimes you don't just need one board, you need to think about everything else that's coming into the view in the room. So I absolutely love these. Now, reflections. We're going to go into that big time when we talk, talk about the drinks photography, but it can be a problem in prop styling because the majority of plates, bowls and cutlery is super shiny highly highly reflective surfaces now you can if you look hard find things that will help with that so brilliant plates that are completely matte which just takes that headache away for you they're not easy to find but you can find them i tend to go around flea markets i know these kind of antique junk stores and pick up old knives and you know i'm looking all the time for old pieces of linen you know for for napkins, anything I think can add to a food story, the storytelling element of this, because it's not always just about the food, depending on what you're trying to do and who you're working with. But here's a little tip that I picked up some years ago. You can get this incredible anti-reflector spray, and it literally does what it says on the tin, which is it takes away that really shiny surface. So I want to use this cheese knife for this particular setup, and it's gorgeous because it's an antique one, but it was still really too shiny. And trust me, if you're not careful with the lighting, that's going to become a hot spot and what draws the eye in the image rather than the food. So we'll give this a quick spray in a moment and, and um, you'll see what I mean. And another little trick with food photography, which is potentially more common with drinks, is to have on hand a, a spray bottle. Just, you know, they're very easy to find. And this is a fine spray bottle, and I think that's probably quite important. And it's just a 50-50 mix of glycerin, which is actually an old, the natural glycerin is a, is a makeup product. And you can pick a bottle up for a couple of pounds, honestly. And you do a complete 50-50 mix with water, and it gives that effect of condensation. So as if you've got food or drink from a cold fridge into a warm environment, actually condensation does start to melt quite quickly. And so it's not good on sets, particularly if you're using hot lighting, which some people still do. So this, trust me, does not budge. And we've actually used it in this scenario to just put a bit of highlight and texture onto the grapes and the figs. So um, always have a bottle with me. Styling is finished and I'm happy with the composition. And now it's time to make a decision about the lens. So I thought it would be a 50, but, uh, and that's to do with, again, experience, but also knowing that if it's similar to eye level, I knew this would give us the amount of the frame that I wanted. So I've put the 51.8 on, and it's very important now to talk about aperture because with these flat lays, there is some height to this particular, if you like, composition of food. The grapes and the board alone give us nine centimeters. And, I, I, and I've measured it and you might think, really, why? I do need to know because in this particular type of image, having, say, the top of the grapes out of focus or the cheese or, or the biscuits out of focus, it would be a fail. I'm afraid. Sometimes, of course, I want tiny, tiny depth of field, but not in this overlay scenario. So I know that's 10 centimetres. The next thing I needed to measure was the distance from the board to the sensor in the camera. And that was 88 centimetres. Now, obviously, that exact measurement doesn't matter. It's not that 88 centimetres is right at all. It's just that I need to know the, the figure. I haven't yet done any of my settings and actually you will realize that I use some Sony software called Imaging Edge that you can use on phones and tablets and laptops and it means that I can make the judgment call about composition and everything and even change settings and take the picture from my laptop. I do do all final tweaks of any flat lay image using uh, this method because 
from where I'm standing and looking, what I'm seeing here is not the same as the camera. So it's, you may find that you think, oh, it looks great. You put a camera directly overhead, take the shot, and you're not happy. And you might be a bit confused why. And it is a different image. I was bought an entry-level DSLR, I think about 15 years ago now. And I started shooting on full auto and um, just fell in love, like we all do, became quite obsessive. I moved from that to aperture priority, and that gave me a, a wee bit more control, and that was brilliant. And then following that, I, I moved into full manual. But honestly, although I'm shooting manual today, you've got to do what works for you, as long as you understand why, why you're making decisions, and that's absolutely brilliant. And in this particular setup, actually aperture priority would be perfect, because we do need to be careful about the aperture that we're choosing to make sure we do have focus from the top of the grapes all the way down to the board. Now, I shoot manual, but I didn't shoot manual from the start. I actually was an aperture priority shooter. It's absolutely fine to do this if you want it in auto, but I would recommend aperture priority because the aperture we choose now is absolutely critical. As I've said, because we need to make sure that basically 10 centimeters is in focus. And to do that, I use a depth of field calculator. So I'm gonna show you the information that gives us. I use depth of field calculator apps in order to help me work out fundamentally the, the right aperture for each and every scenario. There's lots of different ones out there, so you just go to the app store. What it's told me though for the two critical, so the information they're going to need is the distance, as, as I said, from the board up to the sensor. The, the, the height of the food is the depth of field amount that you're going to require. It's going to need the focal length of of the lens okay so you put all of that information in and this is telling me that it might surprise you that I'm actually going to need a 5.6 aperture in order to get the 10 centimeters of focus now using natural light that's actually it's not a wide aperture and it's not a desperately narrow aperture but that is going to have an impact on your other settings so I can now put it all into the piece of software that I mentioned earlier and that means again in if you're working in aperture priority, it's going to do it all for you. Don't be scared if you can see that your shutter speed has gone really quite slow, because in order to keep your ISO down, and I've put in 160 ISO, that is giving me a shutter speed reading of 1 15th, which you might think is oh, very, very slow. It is, but that's the whole point of having a stable rig, so shutter speed just doesn't become an issue, and I'm not touching that shutter button, remember, because I'm using the laptop. So if you are getting down to these kind of speeds, either be super careful when you press the shutter or consider using a remote. One of the things I haven't actually mentioned yet is that I shoot in RAW, and again, you may choose to just shoot in JPEG, depending on the camera and everything, and I'm shooting RAW because I always want to have the flexibility of lifting highlights and shadows a wee bit, and so the raw image, I tend to, I think some people would think it's maybe a tiny bit underexposed, but for me it's great because I've still got work to do in post-production. And on that note, the, we're using that natural light, as we said, and that's just side light coming in from a big window source. Very lucky, it's all very straightforward. We're not too close to that window because be careful getting too close to the light source, the drop off across the image and by that I mean the brightness can be much too much on one side of the frame, the side closest to the light source or the window, and, and it can be a bit extreme. So to be, you know, really a metre and a half, two metres in will give you much more even, beautiful lighting. So there's one thing I'm not perfectly happy with, and that's I feel like this side of the frame where the, where the grapes are just need a wee bit of uh, light, a little bit of the shadows lifting. We mentioned reflections earlier, so rather than panic about having to go out and get yourself a reflector, I'm going to make one with some tin foil because the good thing about food, quite a small subject, it's much harder to reflect something onto a human than it is onto a plate of food. See, that was easy. And I've now got my reflector and I can see the effect because I'm glancing down at the laptop here. That's, uh, it's quite dramatic actually. Here we go, bringing the reflector in. Bottom left of the composition, you'll see you can literally, obviously I've come super close to actually show you, but it can make a dramatic difference on the, on the image, okay, obviously. So I'm just going to pull it back just out of frame and tilting the reflector makes a big difference to where the light falls. So have a play, don't just assume that, that vertical is perfect. And for me, I think about, I don't want too much on the board itself, I want it to be more on the food. So for me, about there is just perfect. 
We're finally ready to take the shot and it really now should be as straightforward as pressing the shutter. I've still got my hand on my makeshift reflector here. So I just have a last check composition, where I'm reflecting the light, super happy and using what I'm using with the software, I literally just reach over and click the shutter button. And that is it, photo taken. We finished the food photography element of this how-to and now we're gonna move on to the drink. And I have to say, on purpose, we've chosen to do it quite differently so that you can watch and learn about completely different techniques than we've already demonstrated. And we're going to use a cocktail and we settled on Aperol Spritz because they're a gorgeous colour and they're great to drink. All of the ingredients are in the description. So ideally, go out, buy the ingredients, see if you can recreate this, send us the pictures. You can see that the setup for the drink shot is actually quite different. And probably the first thing to notice is that we've come off the overhead rig and we're now using uh, the tripod, obviously still using the Sony R4 as before, but this time I've put an 85 millimeter prime lens on. It's just the 1.8, again, a really affordable, great lens. I'm going to briefly explain why this looks quite different to the last setup, but it will be easier to explain it in more detail once we get shooting. However, you'll notice I'm still using photo boards that I mentioned earlier. This time we've got a dark wooden one on the bottom and we've got a smaller one here. This board being small is absolutely critical. So when I explain why we're doing everything, just remember that, it, that this has to be quite small, obviously in relation to the size of the glass that you're working with. One addition that is different from earlier is I've actually put a layer of, of PVC that you kind of get, I, I think I've got it off Amazon, dead cheap. And the reason I've done this is to give a little bit of reflection from the glass just to make the image more interesting. So rather than using a mirror or something like that, that's why I've added that in. And then moving back, you probably don't know if you can see from there, but we've actually got this time a, um, a, a light head here, and it's a, it's a Profoto B10, which is uh, 400 watts per second. So that's, put it this way, it's not super powerful. These are very much able to be used out and about. They're very lightweight. We love Profoto because it gives us continuous lighting as well as flash. So you could potentially do all of this with continuous light, by which I mean, a, you know, a torch, a lamp, go to Ikea, honestly light is light, so don't be afraid, I'd just say have a, have a go. The reason I'm going to use flash and not continuous or natural is because we're filming and it is during the day, I'm having to override all of this ambient light due to reflections, which I'm going to talk about in a, in a second. You can totally do this exact setup with natural light. So I want you to imagine that this is actually a white wall. That is what we're creating just in terms of how we film today. There wasn't a white wall. That would be much more, much, much simpler. So we've put that. You could use a shower curtain. You don't want something that's a diffuse material because obviously the light which is pointing at it would disappear. You want something solid that will reflect and bounce back. So best to think of this as a white wall and I'm sure most of you can find one of those. As soon as you start working with polished surfaces such as glass, cars, anything like that, you'll find it becomes quite technical and sadly science-based. There's a great book I learned a huge amount from, it's called Light, Science and Magic. We'll put the link below if you're interested. Fundamentally what it's saying is that working with glass takes into account the science of light and reflection. It can be heavy reading, but it's worth it. And I'm gonna use one of those techniques. There are basically two with glass. One is where you're looking at a bright white background and you need the edges of the glass to be dark because you've got to see the glass. This is the fundamental issue. Or you have a dark background and you need all the edges of the glass to be light or bright. And that's the option that we're going for because I prefer it, both have its place obviously in drinks photography and this is why the light is actually hidden and it's all to do with the family of angles but honestly if you're that interested go away and read about it. So I just wanted to reiterate the issue with glasses that reflects every single light source in the room and you'll only see it depending on where you're standing and the camera is but from here I can see the window directly behind me and that's just a nightmare. We need to get rid of everything and start with a completely blank canvas. So ridding all ambient light and you do that with your settings and 
easiest to probably do are the super low ISO and using your aperture. You know, for a starting point, maybe something like f11. See if that gives you complete blackness and using aperture priority again is great. So I'm going to pull myself one. I'm still not 100% there in terms of the image and you'll see I'm actually going to create a fake drink until I'm totally happy but I'm going to have a drink whilst we do that. So once again we've put the ingredients in the description and uh, it's ratios really with Aperol spritz and to be honest you can you know be, be a bit heavy handed. I tend to be more heavy handed with the Prosecco than anything else but if we're saying it's two parts, let's do it like that, two parts of Aperol and you'll see there's a splash this is why you don't want to be anywhere near your set whilst you're making yourself a drink. Next comes a Prosecco and in theory you should be having twice as much Prosecco as you should the Aperol. So basically that will be two of the double shots. You know you've got to take the bubbles into account so I'm thinking it's more like three of these to be honest. There we go good noises. Now if you drink this where you should be drinking it, which is the likes of Italy, Croatia, etc, they literally put a splash of fizzy water in. It's really, that's almost the finished cocktail. Over here, they tend to be a little bit more liberal with the fizzy water. It's totally up to you, but you know, it's good to put a wee bit in. And with drinks photography, you should actually be thinking about the level of the liquid, and that is a wee bit low. So to be honest, you'd probably be filling it up more like to about there. Aperol can have a tendency to sink slightly to the bottom of the glass. So always give it a stir anyway, because otherwise the first thing you're gonna get is the fizzy water and that's the least important ingredient. Okay guys, so this doesn't have the posh eyes, doesn't have the time, but I'm going to say cheers. That is the taste of summer. I'm now going to make a fake drink, test everything, but this is going to be right next to me. I'm sure lots of you have noticed that there appears to be ice in the glass that is not melting and that's because it's fake ice which some of you will be well aware is a well-known trick of the trade but honestly the reality is it can be really helpful because working with real ice just totally affects timing and that kind of thing so uh, it comes in all kinds of different qualities so just get what you can afford. I'm going to put some like, orange food colouring into some water and just do a quick test so I'm literally here now using my cocktail stirrer and all I want to do is get a similar a similar tone to the Aperol Spritz. As soon as you put liquid into the glass, it, it does change things slightly and in effect the glass almost becomes a lens. So it is important to do these test shots and don't be doing it with the actual cocktail because particularly in real ice, by the time you get this right, you might find that the ice is completely melted and everything's just looking a bit sad. So it really is important to, to do this. You don't want to be wasting good alcohol, hence the food colouring. What I'm doing now is just having a look at my settings. The, the, the flash, the flash head at the back is on full power and, and that may sound like a lot, it's only 400 watts remember. It's at 10 because it's daylight. So remember, I've got rid of all ambient light, it was completely black and so that flash is having to work quite hard. I want you to imagine that that's a white wall and that you ha are firing any kind of light, a lamp, whatever. Remember, the darker it is in the room, the easier and the less light you're going to need. And then you're going to start having a, having, a, having a play. The other thing to do would be to take a window, take a small board like that, put it into the window, making sure that light can come around at the top and at the sides. And critically, the room that you're in behind you must have no light sources. You must turn off all the lights, close all the curtains, have nothing that could be considered a light source within the rest of, of the frame. Really, really important in terms of reflections and the angle of reflection that the only light source is coming from behind. But I promise you can do this with just natural light in a window. Really remember that the board, the backdrop has to stay super small. I'm doing this because you don't want any fingerprints. 
on the actual glass for the final image. Um, you'll be amazed. You know, you don't, you won't even notice until you get into post production. But um, yeah, fingerprints not cool. So here we go. So I'm literally replacing this clean glass. She says, so there's a mark there, and this is brand new. So I will have to just and that was just put in as a place marker for me. So I will take that out, pop it over here. And now you see, I didn't think I'd have to do this on a new glass, but there we go, this is what happens. And I can touch the glass quite happily with the gloves on and not worry about the fingerprints. But otherwise it'd be me spending time in post-production that honestly, better things to do than taking out fingerprints. So the, there's one last thing I need to do if I'm gonna press that shutter. Um, and it's probably going to be to adjust that, but I'm going to give it a spritz of glycerin. And you don't really want it around the very top rim because that's not how condensation works. So I'm just going to pop a wee bit of paper towel there. It doesn't have to be desperately precise, so guys, don't worry about it. And you see, that's why I've got the tea towels down because I'm trying to stop the rest of the set being affected. And there we go, just spritz, 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 spritz. Off we come. And that's the thing about drinks photography. It's actually very quick to take the shot if you've done everything beforehand. And I can't recommend that enough. So it seems like there's a lot and then it's dead quick. Finished image is done. And as I showed you, it was actually very fast to take it. So in essence, I could have used fresh ice, but if you're doing this for the first time, it's probably best not to. It's really up to you. So. In terms of my final settings, ISO 80, super low for the quality of the image, very happy with that. Interestingly, F8, I mentioned maybe starting at F11 earlier and I would still recommend doing that. It's actually beginning, we're in you know, that time of year where it's the afternoon, it's beginning to go dark. If this was summer, you know, there'd be a lot more light than there actually is. And my, so that's F8. And my shutter is 1 3 20th. Now some of you might be like, oh, she's using flash, it's 1 3 20th. And that is because Pro Photos work in high speed sync. I'm not gonna go into that now, but for those of you that were surprised by that, that'll be why. They're in HSS. Now, this light here, I hadn't really mentioned. And this is because I don't want to overcomplicate drinks photography for you. This is what mattered. And as I said to you, you can do this with natural light with a window. That's what you need to think about. Remembering that either natural light's coming in or we're creating that effect of natural light using a bounce light source. This is only very specifically to add dimension to complex glassware. These glasses are lovely but you will have noticed, I'm sure by now, that they are rimmed all the way around. This is actually a really hard glass to shoot. Much more simple to just get a, a balloon gin glass. Go for that and you'll get beautiful results, I promise you. This one is more complex. So this, if you like secondary B light, is purely to add a little bit of additional dimension to the shot. And it's going back to the law of reflection. If you think about the positioning of this, I wanted some light on the side of the glass here. And so look where the light's positioned in relation to my camera. It was giving a direct reflection of the light source. You do want to do these highlights if that's something you're going to have a go at, a big light source, because you want a uh, highlight, if you like, that is ideally the height of the glass, the balloon part of the glass itself. So that's in terms of you thinking, why is she using a strip box? Very common with this kind of photography and it's got a grid on, that's just to keep the light super straight. So I hope you're able to take all of these little bits of information and give it a go. And as you can see, look, I've managed to have half my cocktail and uh, I'm really hoping that you've been drinking along as well. Cheers. That's us done for the day in terms of shooting and how to take professional food and drinks, photography, shots and I just wanted to leave you with five tips of everything that we've covered which I think are the most important so number one if you haven't yet been able to truly see light and if you're even questioning can I or can't I 
in the nicest possible sense, it probably means you can't, please go and find someone who can show you. Most important tip. Once you can see light, which is amazing and brilliant, have fun with it. There are no right or wrong ways to light. It's also about what you like. Have a play, think about the fact today, how we did it, go experiment. With food and drinks photography, everything that's in the frame is really important. And in essence, you can say that about any photography, but it really, because it's still and very considered, every little thing matters. So invest your time and effort in the styling. It might not be something you're naturally good at, or find someone who'll do it for you and team up. I say this for all photographers, regardless of what you're shooting. Ideally, try and be consistent with your style so that your work is recognisable. And if you like high key, bright and airy food and drinks photography, brilliant. Try and become really good at that. Or if you prefer something a wee bit more dark and moody, have an experiment with everything. But in terms of what you show people, what you put out there, try and be consistent so that it feels like the same photographer. I know at the beginning I showed you a number of lenses, but actually I'm a real advocate of getting to know a lens really, really well, rather than just moving on to another lens. So invest in one lens, even if that's the 51.8, and really, really get to know it because all lenses have sweet spots and the best way of using them and that's what I would do because we have different lenses for different reasons. But for food photography, honestly, you can do most of it with just one lens. In photography, if you want to potentially do it professionally, it's hard and lots of people ask for advice. And all I can do is give you, based on my own experience, and I think that as a photographer, you have a huge amount to give. There are lots of people who desperately need beautiful imagery for their businesses or to promote what they do. So collaborate, 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 collaborate. Find people who will benefit from what you do and equally they will give back to you. So for example, chefs, because if you don't like cooking and you don't wanna do it all, find people who will produce the food or as I said, food stylists. Basically, give your skill to other people who need it and trust me, together, everybody's stronger. Photography is a huge subject and I don't think until you begin to learn, you truly realise what you don't know. It, it, it's very exciting and then it can be quite baffling and a bit overwhelming. Honestly, I've always, my analogy has always been a jigsaw puzzle and there can be loads of missing pieces and every critical piece of knowledge fills that picture and knowledge equals confidence. I cannot recommend enough training and learning from other people and it's, it, it's what made a massive difference to me. It's how I learned to see light and, and all the rest of it. So go and spend time with people who love what they do and, and do it well. Brent and I, for the last four or five years, have run a, a photography training establishment called Training by Lumiere. And we're very much about in-person training and small groups and just imparting as much knowledge as we can. Because honestly, learning from other people is really important. And also, photographers do things differently. As I said, there's no right or wrong way. So spend as much time as you can with different photographers and your knowledge can only increase. We really hope that this has inspired you to have a go because that's the whole point. Don't hide your images. If you've had a go at what we've done, please share it. Use hashtag WexHowTo on any form of social media and we'll all have a look and applause your efforts. So give it a go. Just want to say a huge thank you to Sony and to Wex for enabling us to do this and most importantly to all of you for watching. I really hope you've had a good day because I have. Please share your images and best of luck with your food and drinks photography. Mm -hmm.